So today we're going to talk a little bit about posture and develop a, a thorough understanding of forces that impact our our posture, both externally or, or extrinsic factors and, and internally or intrinsic factors. We can look and see how forces both um, internally, you know, by the size of our, our uh, adipose tissue or, or uh, externally by the, the surface that we're standing on or the, the position that we're, we're attempting to move through can impact our posture and our ability to achieve a, a, an outcome, a desired outcome. So when I look at posture control, we can have static and, and dynamic postures. And, and static posture really refers to the body and its segments that are aligned and, and maintained in a certain position. So examples of a static posture then would, would be positions like standing or sitting or lying or kneeling or, or anything where there's not motion involved. And, and then we can take into account the static forces that help to maintain that position. So static posture is non-moving, non... Static postures are, are not moving they're static in nature. Whereas dynamic posture refers to postures in which the body or its segments are moving. Walking, running, skating, jumping, throwing, lifting are all examples of dynamic postures. And, and those forces that develop around maintaining dynamic posture have to be addressed when we're trying to develop a good understanding um, of postural control. So when I look at postural control, it's really a skill that the nervous that the central nervous system learns using information from passive biomechanical elements, from sensory systems, from muscles. So I can I can take a look at my schematic and consider the central nervous system, so our brain and our spinal cord, and then as it drives motion into the peripheral nervous system, cranial nerves and, and the spinal nerves, it communicates between the central nervous system and the rest of the body, I'm gathering information from my afferent division, um, from the sensory division. So that information is being driven back through the peripheral nervous system up into the central nervous system where it's processed information is learned, motor information is then, is then sent back down into the efferent division, the motor division, where we can have small adjustments made in the motor, the voluntary, the somatic nervous system, or small impulses made in the autonomic nervous system. So that area of the central nervous, or the peripheral nervous system, that controls those activities which are not under voluntary control. And as a, as a reflection of that, things then come back through the sensory nervous system, back up to the peripheral nervous system, back up to the central nervous system. So we have this continuous learning feedback loop, which our, our central nervous system is taking information and making those adjustments to maintain either our dynamic position or our static position. And so much of our, our brain's response then to this is based on past experience. So what's happened to us in the past, I'm gathering that information and I'm making those small adjustments to my postural position. So then I can kind of look at how the central nervous system interprets and organizes the input. So I can have reactive responses, which are compensatory responses, which occur as, the, as, as a result to external forces that displace our center of mass. So I am being pushed out of bounds by a, a defender, 
I am making postural adjustments based on the reactive input from that external force. I can also have proactive responses. A proactive response is an anticip anticipatory response. And that occurs in anticipation of a internally generated force. So an example would be, I see the ball coming, I, f I react to the, to the defender, I raise my arms up to adjust to that, that reactive response in anticipation of getting my hands up to catch the ball. So reactively, I'm making an adjustment based on an external force that's been applied, a proactive response or an anticip anticipatory response I am preparing, I'm making an adjustment prior to the movement to maintain the postural direction that I, I'm trying to achieve. So what are our goals of postural control? What, do I, what am I trying to gain by maintaining position of posture? And one is, is to control our body's orientation in space. So we get quite a bit of feedback about where we are in space. And one of the goals of maintaining that postural control is to maintain my body's orientation in space. And secondly, to maintain my center of mass over my base of support. So keeping that orientation of my body in space, maintaining my center of mass over my base of support allows me to maintain balance and, and position, all the while attempting to stabilize my head relative to the vertical. My eyes like to be horizontal. Most of the postural adaptations that we see in, in abnormal positions occur as a as the body's response to maintaining a, a level head so maintaining my my high, my eyes in a, a horizontal position relative to the vertical so that i don't have one one eye higher than the other those are all the things that that drive the goals of our postural control So then I really look at the, the drivers for that postural control. And when I'm looking at those drivers, I'm really talking about what is it that maintains and controls posture. And, and primarily, it's the integrity of the central nervous system. So if I've had an individual who, who has lost the integrity of the central nervous system, who might that be? somebody who has had a traumatic brain injury, somebody who has had a stroke. Uh, well, I've lost that ability to centrally process that information coming in from the periphery. Those individuals will have postural adaptations that are typically less conducive to normal function. Another component that drives the maintenance and control of posture is my visual system. You'll see people that have changes in their vision will have a, a change in, in their postural position. Have you ever seen somebody that is um, trying to uh, read the computer screen and they have to adjust their head to get the right distance? away from the, the, the computer screen and as a result they may end up with they may end up with a kyphotic position they may end up with a uh, a forward head position they may end up with a side bent trunk position so the visual component for posture is a big driver for maintaining normal control. Our vestibular system, 
will have an impact on postural control. I remember when I was a kid, we used to play a game that we would, um, you know, we would uh, race down and and put our heads on the end of a baseball bat and spin around in a circle ten times, and then try to and then try to run back and and that spinning around would disrupt our, our vestibular system and we'd be you know stumbling back like um, like a drunken sailor. That vestibular system, the disruption in the vestibular system would play a tremendous role in trying to maintain both dynamic and static posture. If I don't have that vestibular system, I have I, I lose the ability to integrate my my visual input from my vestibular input and then my brain says I don't know quite what's going on here and people will fall people will will have to lean up against something um, just to maintain that that position and lastly the musculoskeletal system is the last uh, driver that helps to control posture and that comes back to what are those proprioceptive receptors telling us in space are we in a position where our brain is telling us to be, or are we in a position that our brain thinks we're in? Oftentimes I'll have people that will come in and they'll be in a, in a uh, lordotic position and I'll adjust them in to a, a you know, a, encourage a more, a, a more neutral spine position. And the first thing they'll say is, God, I feel like I'm falling on my nose. And that's because their brain has become accustomed to feeling that 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 anteriorly tilted position in the pelvis is in fact a neutral position. So when then you put them in a neutral position, they feel like they are now posteriorly oriented. And again, it, it does come back to our central nervous system. Our central nervous system detects and predicts instability. And it has to be able to respond to all of that input with an appropriate output, which allows us to maintain that equilibrium in any given task. So the joints must have the, uh, an appropriate range of motion to be able to respond. And the muscles have to have adequate strength to be able to provide the force and the speed of contraction to either maintain the static posture or to adjust during dynamic posture. So what types of strategies then might we expect to, to see? And sometimes we'll hear the term postural strategy and postural synergy in the same tone and they, and they in fact do mean the same thing. So when I have changes in position, I will, I will have a variety of different strategies that my body will take. And sometimes I may have a mechanical perturbation where I have a displacement or disruption that changes the relationship of the center of mass from the base of support. So I have a center of mass that is now being moved forward. Um, that would could could occur from a a mechanical perturbation. I could have a sensory perturbation, which may be caused by altering the visual input. So if we cover eyes or the the uh, light changes from a bright sunlight to a darkened room. Uh, those are our examples of of sensory perturbations, and our body will will take specific postural adaptations or postural strategies, and the ankle strategy will consist, depending on the direction, of discrete bursts of muscle activity, either in the ventral or the anterior muscular group, or in the posterior or the dorsal muscle group. So in this example, this picture where we have our, our subject 
moving forward over the shifting their center of mass forward over their um, over their feet what's going to keep them from continuing to move forward and to potentially fall is an, a burst of those posterior muscles so gastroc soleus in the uh, ankle strategy will start to pull the tibia back now if they if we reversed that and she started to lean backward we would see her tib anterior um, as a or her pretibials as as an ankle strategy uh, developing a muscle activity to pull the tibia back forward maintain the the center of mass over the feet which um, you know over that base of support when I look at the the hip then the hip strategy becomes activity from a proximal to distal pattern so in that picture when I'm moving forward my glutes and even probably my my spine extensors are going to come on they're going to become more active in an attempt to to keep from uh, allowing the center of mass to move to move too far forward. In the event though, I have a, a shift in the center of mass that's too far and my ankle strategies and my hip strategies are not adequate enough to maintain stability, I'll have a change in support strategy and the change in support strategy become something that includes a step. So I may step forward, I may step back, I may step to the side, or I may get my hand out and grab a hold of something. So I'm standing next to the, to the chair and I grab the chair for support. Uh, or I grab my, my spouse. So again, when that center of mass shifts beyond the base of support, I have to to create a change in support strategy to keep from to keep from falling over. Now I can also have a strategy that respond or refers to the head stabilizing strategy. And the head stabilizing strategies are used to help to maintain the head during dynamic tasks such as walking um, which is in contrast to the ankle and hip strategy which are used to maintain the body in static situations so my head strategy is more dynamic in nature where my ankle and, and hip strategy is more static in nature the muscle strategies that we described um, in response to perturbations are, are examples of the active internal forces that are employed to counteract the external forces uh, that we're trying to um, that are being overcome to to affect the equilibrium and stability of the body just in an erect standing posture so if I look at a point at which the body contacts the ground that point the ground is essentially pushing back up and that's the what we call the ground reaction force if i look at the direction and add a, a a vector quantity to it it becomes the ground reaction force vector which is the application of the ground reaction force with a with a direction and typically it's a, a applied through the foot uh, or both feet in standing erect posture, which then creates and is is in counter to this line of gravity. So I I have a, a a picture here of our line of gravity, which in in perfect kind of standing posture, you know that line of gravity moves from the, the ear through the acromion, through the greater trochanter, through the Gerdes tubercle in the knee, um, through the tarsal joint. And the ground reaction force would be 
kind of equal and opposite in direction to that line of, of, um, of gravity. So in an ideal erect posture, the body segments are aligned so that the torques and the stresses on the, on the body segments are minimized and that standing can be, can be maintained with a minimum of energy expenditure. So we have this concept then of coincident action lines and they're lines that are formed by the, the ground reaction force vector and the line of gravity, which serve as a reference. The coincident action lines formed by the ground reaction force vector and the line of gravity serve as a reference for the analysis and the effects of the, of the forces on the, on the body segment. So when these two lines coincide, which they do in, in static standing posture, it's possible to assess the effect at each joint using one or the other. But we have to keep in mind that we're not really looking at horizontal forces. We're only looking at vertical forces. So our location of our line of gravity then is continually shifting because of postural sway. So as our as we sway forward and back and, and right and left, our line of gravity is continually shifting. And as a result of this continuous motion of the line of gravity, the moments that are around each joint are constantly changing. The receptors that are in and around the joints and in the soles of the feet detect these, these changes and they are relaying, constantly relaying that information back to our, our central nervous system. So as I look at external and internal moments, when the, when the line of gravity passes directly through the joint axis, there's no external gravitational torque that's created around the joint. However, if the line of gravity passes at some distance away from the, the center of axis, then we get an external gravitational moment. And this external gravitational moment will create the propensity for rotation to occur around that joint axis unless it is opposed by a counterbalancing inertial or internal moment. So if my center of gravity, my line of gravity was to shift anterior, for example, away from the center of gravity of the center of axis of the hip joint, then I would need to have fascial tightness. I would need to have gluteal activation to maintain that postural position so that I wouldn't have to counter that, that need for rotational um, torque to occur. So our, in, our external moments are occurring relative to the line of gravity and the joint axis. And our internal moments are fascial and muscular adaptations to counter that that need for for a um, for rotation to occur. Now the the magnitude of the moment of force increases as the distance of the line of gravity increases away from the, the center of the ax of the joint axis. So that kind of takes us then to looking at what is our optimal position, our optimal postural position that minimizes energy expenditure in the standing position. And again, because the force of gravity is constantly acting on the body, an ideal standing posture 
is going to be one at which the segments are all, are all aligned vertically and the, and the line of gravity passes through all the joint axes. So when I look at what is the ideal position for the ankle, in the optimal erect posture, the ankle joint is in a neutral position. Neutral position is really defined as um, a 90 degree position relative to the vertical. So the joint is kind of midway between dorsiflexion and plantar flexion and the, and the line of gravity passes slightly anterior to the lateral malleolus. So here is my ma lateral malleolus, the line passes slightly anterior to it. So with this anterior position of the line of gravity relative to the ankle joint, it, re it creates an external dorsiflexion moment that must be opposed by some internal plantar flexion moment. Otherwise, we'll have forward motion of the tibia. And when I have a neutral position, there's no ligamentous checks, checks that are able to counter that, that rotational control or that rotational moment So we have the result of that is a small activation of the plantar flexors, which decrease or equal that external dorsiflexion moment. So really what, what occurs then is that the soleus contract and, and pull the, the, the tibia anterior or pull the tibia posteriorly and that's how it it opposes the dorsiflexion moment in the optimal posture for the knee the joint is in full extension and the the line of gravity passes just anterior to the midline of the knee and posterior to the patella so this puts the the line of gravity just anterior to the knee joint axis so the knee joint axis is here, the line of gravity is slightly anterior to it. So that anterior location of the, of the line of gravity in relation to the, to the joint axis creates an external extension moment that tends to keep the knees extended. Now the difference between the knee and the ankle is that the counterbalancing, the internal flexion moment, is created by passive tension in the posterior joint capsule and the and the associated ligaments. So now instead of having a muscle contraction that that creates an active counter to an external moment, I have a passive internal flexion moment that is occurring secondary to, to you know secondary from the ligamentous in the capsule, so I don't have to have um, a quadricep contraction to maintain that position. Occasionally, we will see a small amount of hamstring activity, but again, when I'm looking at the at the tibia being pulled posterior by the soleus, that may be enough to augment and maintain that, that knee extended position. So when I look at the hip and the pelvis, in, in ideal posture, the, the hip is in a neutral position and the pelvis is level. No anterior or posterior tilt. And with a, a level pelvis, the lines connecting the symphysis pubis and the ASIS are vertical. That's how we can tell if that is uh, aligned. And when I look at the ASIS and the PSIS, so the anterior superior iliac spine and the posterior superior iliac spine, that line would be horizontal. 
in an ideal posture the line of gravity passes slightly posterior to the axis of the hip joint through the greater trochanter but with postural sway the line of gravity may actually shift anterior to the hip joint and a contraction of the hip extensors may be required when that line of gravity is posterior to the axis the the countering internal torque or internal moment arm is is met by the ligamentous attachments of um, of the y ligament of big of bigelow now looking at the lumbosacral and sacroiliac joints the average lumbosacral angles measured at the bottom of l5 vertebrae and to the top of, of the sacrum of S1. And typically, as we, as we learned earlier, it's about 30 degrees. But an anterior tilting of the sacrum increases the lumbosacral angle, which results in an increase in the shearing effect, the shearing force on the lumbosacral joint. And this may in turn, increase the anterior lumbar convexity when we're standing. In the optimal posture, the, le the line of gravity passes through the body at the fifth lumbar vertebrae. And it's quite close to the axis of rotation of the lumbosacral joint. So looking at it from that perspective, gravity creates a very slight extension moment at L5 to S1. which will in turn tend to slide L5 and the, the rest of the, of the lumbar spine down and forward on S1. And what opposes this motion is the anterior longitudinal ligament and the iliolumbar ligaments. We also get bony resistance that is provided by the locking of the of the facet joints at the lumbosacral articulation. With the sacrum in, a, in an optimal position though, the line of gravity passes slightly anterior to the SI joint. The external gravitational moment is created at the SI joint that tends to cause the anterior superior portion to rotate anterior and inferior. and passive tension in the sacro, uh, sacrospinalis passive tension in the sacrospinous and the sacrotuberous ligaments provide the internal moment that counterbalances that gravi gravitational torque which is preventing the upward tilting of the lower end of the sacrum when it comes to looking at the vertebral column we can see a tremendous amount of, of variation. So the optimal position of our line of gravity is through the midline of the trunk. Now the line of gravity in relation to the head will pass slightly anterior to the frontal axis of rotation for flexion and extension, which creates an external flexion moment. So this external flexion moment, which tends to tilt the head forward, is countered by the internal moment generated by tension in the ligamentum nuque, the tectoral membrane, and the posterior aspect of the zygopophyseal joint capsules and activity of the capital extensors. So in, a, in an ideal line, again, that line of gravity should pass right through the ear. And the head should be directly over the body's center of mass occurring at about S2. So when I'm looking at um, optimal alignment and analysis from an anterior and posterior view, the line of gravity 
bisects the body into symmetrical halves. So the head's nice and straight, the eyes are level, there's no tilting, there's no rotation. The face is bisected into two equal halves. The clavicles and shoulders should be level. The scapula inferior angles should be level. The waist angles, the ASIS and PSIS, they should lie in a, in a line that is, is parallel to the ground. So looking across and across, those lines should be parallel to each other, parallel to the ground. They should be equal distance from the line of gravity. So looking from the line of gravity out, it should be equal distance. The joint axis of the hips, of the knees, and of the ankles should be level with each other, should be equal distance from the line of gravity. And our feet should be slightly turned out. So from a anterior to posterior perspective, there is minimal muscle activity that's required to maintain this position from a you know, side to side perspective. The gravitational torques that are occurring on one side are countered by the gravi gravitational torques occurring on the opposite side. So the, the, the forces are equal and opposed. So that's kind of what I'm looking for in optimal uh, postural positions from a anterior posterior perspective and from a lateral perspective. Next time we'll talk a little bit about um, abnormal postures and deviations from optimal alignment and we'll, we'll see how looking at the rib cage and mobility through the, through the chest may influence those, um, that postural alignment.